So welcome to our panel called From the Top. I'm Rebecca, a fourth year music business student at the University of Gloucestershire and have recently spent some time working in industry. Um, at... Hi, Becky. Hi, I'm so sorry my computer crashed, but sorry to hold you up. No worries, we're just getting started. So um, yeah, I'm a fourth year music business student at the University of Gloucestershire and have recently spent some time working in industry at an independent label in London. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by our keynote speaker and campaigner for women in music, Vic Bain, CEO of the artist and business development service generator, Hannah Matteson, and Naz Hussain, the group financial controller at the industry body BPI, who specialise in music rights management and organise the annual Brit Awards and Mercury Prize, and is also on the BPI Equality and Diversity Board, and also Becky Ayres, who is the Managing Director of Sound City, the Festival Ambassador of She Said So, um, which is a community global platform for women and gender minorities in music. So Wic, uh, Vic wonderfully introduced the topics for today, but in this discussion, I want to highlight some key issues surrounding diversity, whether this be in terms of gender, race, disability, financial status or geographical location. So that this conversation is really constructive, I want you as an audience to think about how you can play a key part in creating a diverse and fair environment for people from all backgrounds to thrive and progress without barriers and prejudice in the industry. Music has a huge potential to influence the way our wider society operates, whether you are just entering the industry or you've been working in it for 20 years. We should all be working collaboratively towards an all-inclusive narrative that underpins everything we do within our working practice to ensure the industry is inclusive and successful as possible. So I want to dive straight in. Um, Becky, I want to discuss the Key Change Pledge and what this means for Sound City. So during a Music Week article last month, you announced the full um, 2021 lineup for the festival is going to be revealed as 50-50. I did notice on the first announcement poster that female artists feature quite low down. Um, and they're predominantly backed by uh, male band members. So how have you been working on getting female headliners and promoting female solo artists at the festival? I think that's a brilliant question. I'm really glad you've asked me that actually, because um, key change is something that is absolutely integral to festival organisers and people that are booking any sort of lineup. And it's something that we are very, very um, take very seriously as Sound City because we've been since Key Change launched in um, 2018. We've been the lead UK UK festival for Key Change, and what that actually means is that we set ourselves the standard of ensuring that we have equality across our lineups. Now, the first time that we managed to do that was last was actually last year in 2019 when we had Mabel as a headliner, and we had a just over, we had 58% um, female to male artists, which was, you know, which was the first time we'd really overachieved on that pledge. This year, when we announced our lineup, I was absolutely really, I was really pleased to see how people came back to us and said, you know, you're the Key Change Festival and you actually at the moment don't have, um, you know, a top tier of female acts. And I was really encouraged by that because it shows how much this conversation has moved on, how important it is. And we felt at the time, because when, when we announced we had Reggie Snow as our headliner and we had Red Rum Club, who are local um, working class lads from Liverpool um, as the on the lineup. But then there was a clear um, area there for um, another headliner, which will be female. And we'll also have a lot of female acts on the top tier. Now, that lineup, when we announced it, was a fraction of what we'll be announcing. We'll have around 300 acts. And I, have, I absolutely agree and I embrace the fact that, that to have a truly gender equal lineup, that you must have female acts across every tier. And so that's why I was absolutely, I welcomed that, um, that critique really from people because I thought this just shows how important it now is to people. And it shows that we, you know, have got to, to make sure that we make good on that pledge, but also, you know, that we set an example and we, encourage others to do that because I think you know as um you know Vic Bain has actually um done a brilliant resource which shows which female acts um you know about it talks about female acts and about 
who's available across every sort of tier. There's lots of other people doing brilliant work on that as well. So there's no excuse anymore not to, you know, not to have gender equal lineups. I was going to ask actually, as a new music champion, uh, Sound City obviously champions new music, you're expected to take risks and therefore can challenge promoters. But do you have any thoughts for major festivals, especially when there's quite a high um, job turnover in the sector? Do we need perhaps boards to represent and enforce long term change um, and these boards be made up of diverse members? I think with major festivals, I think obviously when you've got some of the bigger festivals that are owned by, you know, by multinational conglomerates, some of the time, you know, they may they may not be seeing the argument coming through from their ticket sales. You know, people might still be buying into the festivals, you know, as is the case of festivals like Reading and Leeds, you know, who have been criticised a lot in the past. It's difficult because, you know, when Key Change launched, um, I know that um, PRS Foundation Vanessa Reed at the time did actually go to Live Nation and did go to Festival Republic to ask about them joining. And I think they felt at the time that they had their own schemes. I know that Festival Republic re launched Rebalance, which was their own gender equality scheme. And I think it's difficult, you know, obviously at that very high, at that top tier of big multinational festivals compared to the independent sector in the independent sector you've got a lot more autonomy about what you do it's harder to influence that kind of thing and I don't know whether a board that sits above that I don't know whether would whether that would really change anything because you know a board can sort of talk about it and steer things but and I guess that's what key change um, is it's a global movement to encourage that change I'm not really sure how that would influence, you know, those bigger multinational companies when they sort of don't really see the impact on their bottom line. So maybe they don't feel that there's a real need to change it. I think it's got to come from every angle, really. And, you know, the more that music fans make their voices known, and I think artists like the 1975 who've said that they won't play on non-gender equal bills, I think that's, you know, it's absolutely... Um, key that you get those voices coming in from all angles really that then help change that argument. Yeah I think that's really critical um, and I want to ask everyone really do you think perhaps women are feeling discouraged to play festivals um, as an invite may now be seen as uh, tokenistic you know maybe they're just being invited because they are a female band um, they're being offered smaller deals in terms of pay or marketing support for their slot in comparison to their male counterparts. Do you think that the live industry has created a culture that fosters a male dominated environment whereby females or those of minority don't feel safe on stage or backstage? Um, Naz, did you want to bring up a point about that? Um, not necessarily just a point about that, but I do think when it comes to, you know, live environments, particularly with festivals, um, you have two types of festivals. Obviously, you have the mainstream festivals like the wireless and uh, um, and all those other things. But then you also have local festivals organised by um, the council. And it's important to engage with local councils also to encourage um, grassroots performances from upcoming artists and give them an opportunity to sort of um, learn and hone their craft, which will then sort of maybe perhaps, you know, build a, build a fan base, build their reputation and uh, encourage the bigger festivals to then bring those acts onto their um, onto their lineup, I guess. Uh, so, so there are hundreds and hundreds of festivals organised locally by local councils and they're all free festivals and it's important to probably engage with local councils as well. So it's a policy thing as well, in as well as, you know, um, signing up for uh, Key for Change, which is an amazing initiative. I agree, it's definitely about really um, targeting it from the bottom, isn't it? And then, you know, we, we may see change at the top. Um, did anyone have any thoughts around perhaps the culture of festivals and females feeling safe. I think yeah, I can, oh, sorry, go on. Sorry, Becky. Um, no, I was just going to say that um, I think from our experience of running a festival, we've tried really hard to make that 
um, kind of a priority. And knowing that um, Generator over the last few years has tried to make more of a shift towards that 50-50 gender balance and and that all of those all of the things that come alongside that need to be considered as well and um, i think it's not quite as easy as just going okay well we'll just put lots more women on this without kind of understanding the the impact on the whole infrastructure of a festival or of a gig or of an event or whatever it is because our key change pledge for generator you know isn't just about our festival it's about our panels it's about our staff it's about our workforce it's about the our participants of programs so we we think about it on a on a almost daily basis of trying to make sure that these things are considered in everything that we do um so i think it's important that it's obviously important that we have a gender balance but it's important that we recognize the implications of what that means kind of surrounding that rather than just on the face of it um, and that might not necessarily be um, kind of portrayed to the public as as well as what it maybe should be um, but I think we're certainly making the right kind of steps in that direction anyway. Um, yeah that's a really great point actually Hannah and um Vic, you've devised the fantastic website that is the F list, which you spoke about in your keynote earlier. Um, it shares your frustrations around needing to kind of hand out the names of female artists in order to encourage change. And this also brings to mind actually a poster that Lucy McCourt devised in response to gender inequality at Reading and Leeds, which some of you may have seen circulating the internet. Um, how are festival promoters, bookers, and music supervisors using your F list? Well, obviously, this this year um, went a little differently to how I was expecting it when I when I published that list in February. Um, but in the first few weeks before before lockdown, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, uh, all I know is that hundreds and hundreds of people every day were were um, looking at the list. I don't know exactly who they were, but half a dozen festivals contacted me directly wanting advice um, or, you know, on how, how best to use the, uh, the F list and how could they go about booking more women on their stages. And they were very varied festivals. One was a traditional Scottish music festival in um, uh, the north of Scotland. Another was a rock music festival in Brighton and everything in between. So that was really heartening. I thought already even then, at that stage, right, this is uh, this is a success. Unfortunately, none of those festivals will have will have um, gone on this year. Hopefully, fingers crossed for, for for next year, we'll be we'll be back at some some level. Um, I, and I know since then, uh, event event promoters have have been using the list to find women for online events. So I've been contacted by a few promoters and event event organisers who've who've just dropped me a line. You know, they didn't have to um, tell me that they were doing it. Dropped me a line to say thank you very much. We've uh, we found we have found women through your spreadsheet. Uh, as I mentioned in um, my speech this morning, I I have spent the summer redeveloping the the F list website. So on the 23rd of November, it's going to be relaunched. It's a beautiful. WordPress directory, which is really, um, uh, you know, has great search functionality. You can search um, by location, you can search by instrument, you can search by musical genre, you can search by keywords, you know, looking for um, looking for people's labels or publishers or, or the names of the of the bands or the or the musicians themselves. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, any any um, woman who wants to be on the F list who is not already, can, they can create their own listing and they can put m much more information up. They can put their, their social media links, their, their music and photos and biographies and, and everything. So it really is just going to grow and grow and get better and better as more people use it and put information on. So I'm really excited about its potential. I've got lots of partnerships with, um, you know, various uh, promoter and venue organisations um, lined up as well. So yeah, watch watch this space from the 23rd of November. I think it's really great to hear that people have been using it for online events because you know these 
gender conversations and diversity conversations don't go away because we're focusing on COVID. So it's really uh, important to keep focusing there. Um, Naz, did you have a question? Um, not, not a question, but just a comment. I mean, uh, adding on to what Vic was saying, I think it's um, incredible that the work that they're doing in terms of creating a, um, an area and a resource for people to then go in and, um, you know, encourage female people to perform at, um, and have lineups on their festivals. But I think equally what's also important as well is that not to just look at the female performers, also look at, you know, who's doing the staging, who's doing the security, all the vendors, the lighting, the filming, uh, and perhaps, you know, uh, encourage um, those festival organizers to even maybe, you know, meet certain quotas in terms of their workforce that goes into supporting those festivals as well. And that's equally important as well to create opportunity and those that want to get, get into those business and that kind of environment as well. Absolutely. And I think that really uh, brings back to Vic's keynote this morning, where you mentioned that there's really a small percentage of females getting into engineering roles. Um, but Becky, in Music Week, you spoke about the role of label bosses, AR execs and artist managers joining the responsibility for artist development to bring more diversity into the industry. Vic stated that only 19.6% of female acts um, are signed and this could be changed by removing the traditional male lens and employing more female A&R. But A&R is often an out of hours job that doesn't suit females with young children, despite technology kind of allowing them to work more remotely. This again comes down to creating an environment that is more conducive for females. And as employers, should we be we should be allowing sorry for mental well-being and the work-life balance. I also want to touch on the UK the fact that the UK Music Diversity Report, which was released last week, shows us that there's a good racial and gender percentage of people coming into the industry at a ground level. Vicky also said that there are 65 uh, percent of women in entry level jobs, but this drops off by 20 percent at CEO and management positions. This proves that the, that the cause of a toxic environment is a systemic issue. Um, the government requires businesses of over 250 employees to publish the gender pay gap, with Live Nation as an example shockingly revealing a 41 percent gender pay gap in salaries and an 88 percent pay gap in bonuses, which is just shocking. Um, through campaigning, we are only seeing these figures go down by a minuscule amount every year. There doesn't seem to be that much shame from uh, these companies that we're really calling out. Um, and therefore, UK Music are calling for smaller businesses of over 50 employees to be transparent. Firstly, Naz, do you BPI, who represent major labels and have signed up to the UK Music 10-step plan, have enough weight to encourage change. The industry is sometimes seen as an exclusive club and majors do take advantage of this by offering um, people starting out low paid salaries for a long time because people so desperately want to work in them. Um, well, I think, first of all, I think the BPI represents the recorded music industry um, of which the uh, major record labels are part of our membership network, but we also represent over 450 independent record labels as well. Um, is, there a, is there a responsibility in terms of, um, you know, what's important is that we can't impose, the record labels are effectively our stakeholders. So we can't dictate to them in terms of what, what they should or what they shouldn't be doing. But what we can certainly do is influence their decision-making and um, you know, encourage them to sort of take up good practices. And we certainly work with the executives of the record labels, whether it's majors or independents. We work with their HRs. We work with the, you know, all the record labels and some independent record labels have their internal you know, diversity policy. And we work with those uh, boards to shape their framework in terms of how they approach um, diversity. And we certainly seek to influence them. Have, out of interest, you actually approached any of the majors or have they spoken to you about the 10-step plan? Well, I think, um, you know, uh, it's, you know, we support the 10-step plan. We've 
BPI as a trade body have bought into it um, and you know we're committed to um, achieving those 10 steps and I don't think um, you know being a representative of, of all the major, major record labels and independents I don't think we would sign up to it had we thought that these the record labels are um, not in agreement so certainly they are uh, and they bought, bought into it and we seek to use our um, influence as a trade body to kind of encourage them guide them provide resources networks to make sure that they sign up to those uh, 10 point plans as well and we will look to monitor it over the course of um, however many months and weeks and years ahead brilliant and i think um also really vitally with the 10 step plan is that they have actually put targets together for you know by the end of october we want to see this by the end of november we want to see this so i really look forward to seeing what companies are meeting what goals um secondly hannah what are your thoughts when it comes down to internal recruitment there needs to be more of a value exchange per perhaps offered by companies so that people can know their worth when being recruited and why they are valuable to a company. Um, why do you think we're not able to retain female talent later down the line? I know with Generator, you've worked with the likes of Nadine Shah. How do you work on female business growth and breaking down these barriers? Do you think women should be challenging their employers at the interview stage about bonuses and whether they are adhering to plans such as the 10-step plan? So um, we have a phrase in the northeast, which is shy bends get nagged. Um, and it's basically, you know, if you don't say you don't get and it and I am kind of unfortunately a firm believer in it. <laughs> it shouldn't be the case, but it should be that we should be questioning the we should be questioning recruiters at this point and saying, you know, so what 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 are my progression options? How do I move from this level to the next one to the next one? Where do I want to, where do I want to be in five, 10 years time? And how do I get there? And how are you going to help me get there? And, and I think, you know, I think, I think employers should be thinking about that when they employ a person at that entry level um, and think about how they can develop them and how they can help progress that person in their career in whatever way that might be. Um, I know from, my experience, so I've only been CEO at Generator for seven months, she says, um, and it was um, it was quite daunting as a woman under 30 to go for that kind of position. Um, and I certainly felt like in my interview, and this is no no disrespect to any of my, my fantastic board or anything like that, but it certainly felt as though that my interview surprised them. Um, and I felt that. So that's, you know, that's not a great place to be in when, you know, that shouldn't be the case. Um, and so I'm really keen on making sure that even when we are selecting, selecting people to interview for positions, that we do have a gender split in, in that pool, in that talent pool, because I think I want to give people those opportunities. If you're not even getting the opportunity to interview, how are you ever going to progress um, because it might be a learning experience for you. It might be that it's just not the right role, but it might be that there's something fantastic in there that I can see in that person. Um, and we've made a lot of changes to our board. So we're looking, you know, we're trying to to make sure that it's much more representative. We have just brought, um, brought into play a youth advisory board as well. Um, and that is predominantly female as well, which is great. And we are really starting to see those changes happen in and around our organization but also that the perception of the public means that people expect that from us now so we've set the bar we've set the standard and if we can do that in our organization i don't see myself as as in a kind of leadership position why i shouldn't be able to challenge other people in other organizations around me to do the same um, because again, I'm not shy and I will say that and I will question and I will challenge in a very friendly way most of the time. Um, but, and, but I think it's about perseverance and it's about saying we're doing it. Why? Why can't you? So I think it's a really, really interesting point. And, and I think, you know, it, um, 
there are still some preconceptions. I think there are still some concerns around why women should or shouldn't or can or can't do a certain role. And, um, you know, it's not true. Um, but we've got to we've got to keep trying and we've got to keep working with those people to change to change those kind of um, institutionalized opinions. Fantastic. Naz, did you want to add anything there? Um, absolutely. I mean, it's a great question and I fully endorse what Hannah's saying, you know, absolutely. Um, when, you know, when it comes to looking at internal framework and recruitment practices, it's important to put things in place um, to ensure that, you know, if you're using recruiters, you're encouraging them to put forward a, a pool of candidates from different backgrounds. You know, the way you advertise a role and the language you're using to encourage different applicants from different backgrounds as well. And also, you know, like, uh, you know, from personal experiences, I've, you know, attended interviews and, you know, gone on to second interviews and third interviews. And finally, I, I receive, receive a rejection. And often when I ask for a feedback, the feedback is, well, that wasn't a good fit. You wasn't a good fit. What does you wasn't a good fit mean? Is there a kind of um, unconscious bias about how um, we frame a good fit, you know, what does that mean? And also within organisations, you know, and looking at the report yesterday, you know, it's clear that we're, you know, encouraging people from different backgrounds, male, female, to get come into the music business. But clearly between middle management and higher management, there's a drop off, right? Why is that? You know, are we, um, are we, you know, not doing succession planning? Are we not promoting people from different backgrounds, you know, is there a ceiling? And I think some research and work needs to go behind uh, informing those kind of um, those kind of patterns, I guess. Uh, but it's important certainly to look at yourself internally, put practices in place, and then, you know, um, you know Hannah seems like a great leader of, of business and have people like Hannah within those positions who can make those decisions because Ultimately, you need the buy-in of the senior individuals within your organization for it to then cascade down. It's not always uh, possible to make those changes from grassroots entry-level roles. Um, it, it needs to come from the top down. Definitely, I agree there. Vic, what would you like to add? Yeah, just um, I'm actually doing that research. I'm now doing a, a part-time PhD looking at women's careers in the music industry. So I'm uh, looking at, um, I've spent the past year looking at literature regarding uh, women's career patterns. And unfortunately, I, it, you know, I really like, um, uh, you know, the phrase, shy Ben's getting out, uh, which I've heard before because I'm originally from the Northeast. <laughs> Uh, and I'd forgotten about that. But um, unfortunately, the, the research shows that when women ask for pay rises or get more assertive, that they are rejected in, in um, far higher statistics and numbers than men. So there's a there's a, a whole body of work that looks at um, you know women's confidence and how pushy. They, they can be, and, uh, and actually women are rejected because they're going against the stereotype of what a, of what a woman, you know, how a woman in business should behave. So there's a, um, there's a really great paper um, produced by an academic at King's by Christina Scharf, and she's written a paper called Blowing Your Own Trumpet, which is, you know, exactly, exactly that. And, uh, and unfortunately, yeah, women, women get, get punished for being uh, seen as not feminine. The, you know, they have these mas masculine um, attributes of being confident and asking for pay rises and stuff, and they get they get turned down. So that needs to be challenged and called out as well. Absolutely, I think um, as women growing up, you're not always encouraged to be confident and be outspoken. Um, and so I wanted to touch on. Um, how we see a lot more women creating side hustles and being self-employed because they don't feel valued in organisations within the industry. Um, should we as young creatives and talents be finding mentors? Becky, can you tell us a little bit more about She Said So and their aims and how could we make the most of um, the mentoring programme? So I think mentors are, re are really important and I just and having people that will just that you can call on really just to 
get advice and just as a sounding board. And I think one of the things, well, she said so, is, was set up um, a few years ago as a global movement by um, Andrea Magdalena, who's actually based in LA. And she set it up as, um, first of all, as a, as a Google group. And then over time, it's just grown and grown. And there's um, local chapters have started up um, around different places. So there's one in Mumbai and there's one in um, in London. And we actually started a northwest, not a northwest, sorry, a northern chapter, which started with Liverpool and Manchester um, a few a few months ago. And it's an inf it's basically an informal network of women who want to basically just support each other and and just we do we've got a, a Facebook group and Instagram and Twitter and we do a lot of posts about jobs and shout outs and initiatives and schemes that can help support women and then we've just um, started running a mentoring scheme as well which is um, basically just a just so that you know to support anybody predominantly it's been younger women that have been starting out but um there's also there's a, there's also other programs available at the moment like there's a brilliant leadership program that brighter sounds are um are putting together with remy harris and tamara gallon where, where they're um starting to mentor um female leaders and and gender minorities also so um so there's a lot there's quite a few different support mechanisms we actually run a mentoring scheme through sound city as well because we run a training program for young people that um don't have any um formal education in music to help them take their first rungs on the ladder so we also run that and i think what my sort of feeling at the moment is really the need to join it up because i know for example generator do some fantastic work you know in similar areas and there are so many other organisations like Brighter Sound, as I mentioned, and I think you know through she through, the, through she said so with m the mentoring that we've set up. Um, you know, at the moment we've we've got several people that we're looking after, and we want to expand that. And it's just about creating finding those people that want to be mentors, because I think sometimes people think you know that I'm maybe that they don't have the experience to do it, but it's really you know just finding it's finding somebody that you trust and that maybe is they don't have to be like really experienced either they might just be a few steps forward in their career than you are and I think that certainly you know I'm very I'm really dismayed to hear that you know young women do feel deterred from entering in the industry because I know you know certainly you know for myself we're also we also look at um, diversity across every strand of what we do and we've got a 50-50 um, representation on our workforce with you know female and senior positions as well and I think that you know that that women shouldn't be I think it's fantastic if people if women do want to set up their own freelance careers because that's brilliant because they'll start their own um, companies or their own initiatives but I think it, if they do feel deterred it's it's really you know the mentoring side and building upon that is, is key because that helps then create that confidence and and it just, you know, and, and it just breaks down some of the barriers, really. And I think we are seeing a lot of positive opportunities for females. And these me mentoring schemes are really helping us. Um, and I just really quickly want to touch on other positive female stories in the industry. I mean, we've seen David Joseph at Universal recently appointed Rebecca Allen as the president of Decca Records. We've also seen Camille Hurst step into the head of Spotify for artists. Um, and... So I just wanted to ask Vic very quickly, what are your thoughts around um, gender and ethnic diversity in the director's seat? And what do you think about the women's, the Music Week Women's Role of Honours being recently announced since I know you featured in 2000, 2017? Yes, and I, and I helped to, um, or contributed to the nomination of some of, of, some of uh, this year's um, um, nominees as well actually so you know I think the Women in Music Awards are a fantastic idea uh, you know the amount of uh, music industry awards I've turned up to where it's been 90% men on stage uh, so you know it's it's really nice to have a, a, a platform where we honour on our women and yeah women in leadership roles it, you know there's lots of research that shows connections between women in leadership positions and uh, more you know friendlier uh, friendlier to women working environments. I think women are, are just sort of more more aware 
of diversity in 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 that in that respect. So, um, female pressure, an organisation who do research into electronic music festival lineups. So they've done that uh, for seven or eight years now. I think nearly seven hundred festival editions, and they have found a link between the um, the organisations which are which are run by women. They have more women on their stages. And Rebecca Allen, who, who's actually um, uh, in charge of Decca Classics, her roster is over 40% female, which is which is very high <laughs> compared to one of the best compared to um, most of the most of the other labels. So there, so there is a link. So what we what we have to do is ensure that women progress in the same numbers. Otherwise, we're going to become a sector which is which is like nursing. Which is predominantly female in the in the lower ranks. The women do all of the work in the in the lower ranks, but all of the consultants and the and the managers and the directors are still predominantly male. And the music industry is sort of transforming into a model like that. And uh, I don't I don't think that's that's good good for anyone. No, certainly. Naz, did you want to add a point there? Yeah, I think I, absolutely. I think Vic's right. I mean. Um, when it when it when it comes to diversity, whether it's race or gender, it's um, you know records and data shows us those companies that are diverse and have a good gender balance are usually more successful and you know achieve their targets. Uh, and it's a fact. So you know if you want to be successful, you need to have a diverse workforce uh, at all levels. Uh, particularly at board level as well. I'm picking up on uh, what um, Hannah said earlier about mentorship and career progression. Absolutely, it's important to have um, right mentors paired up with the right people to provide guidance, provide career progression advice, uh, and just be that sounding board of issues that may come up. And it's important that those those people who are mentoring are uh, actually are gaining skills from people that they are uh, being mentored by and vice versa as well. So you now I've acted as a mentor and, and, and people that I've mentored, actually I've learned a lot from them and how they see the world and, uh, and I've, I've been able to use those learnings and then apply it into my working environment as well. So there's learning both ways in, in that kind of area. So it's important to have um, you know, framework and strategic approach in place to be able to mentor and it's important and that goes down to also succession planning and you know uh, you're, you're helping create the next generation of leaders so it's important to have the right mentors mentoring the right people and the right guidance and the infrastructure to support it by your company as well definitely at the start there you touched on as well that we shouldn't forget about um, all different types of diversity and accessibility um, Vic, equal access at live music events is often forgotten about um, and you've just joined Attitude is Everything, which is a fantastic network. How are you going to combat diversity and access for disabilities when venues start to reopen? Well, yes, I'm very honoured to be to be working with Attitude. Um, it's only an interim contract, actually, so maybe only a few, a few months we'll see. We'll see. Um, and they've been going for 20 years and over that 20 years they've built up a network of well over 200 venues and festivals that who have gone through and participated um, and gotten their, their charter levels. So they have brought bronze and silver and gold depending on uh, you know how accessible and how committed those venues and festivals are. So that's a you know that's a huge number and I you know I believe that they've Gosh, I mean, they've really made a profound difference. Uh, 20 years ago, going to gigs and festivals. I mean, occasionally I'd see people, uh, you know, with mobility problems, um, it, it, but not many. And now at all of the big festivals, they have viewing platforms at all as a, as a basic requirement, you know, never mind um, you know, sign language um, uh, interpreters and all sorts of amazing things. So, yeah, it's such an honour to be to be working with with them, and uh, you know we're going to be very busy over the next few months working with a lot more organisations who've received Arts Council Cultural Recovery Fund money, and they you know they've all had to sort of 
you know, explain their diversity as part of receiving that that money. So actually, I think we're going to be really busy over over the next six months ensuring that accessibility is embedded into all of the reopening plans. However, that's going to look. You know, I don't know if we'll be back as normal next year. I think we'll have some sort of uh, you know hygiene and testing processes um, uh, required for for events to 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 be able to go ahead. But however, however that ma manifests, yeah, we really want disability to be a core part part of that as well. We don't want anybody being being forgotten about when we reopen. Is there anything that you've particularly picked up on? that we can be embedding into our events going forward to really help access? Well, working with Attitude <laughs> uh, really is, is the place to start because they're, they're the experts. They've been doing this for, for 20 years. And as I say, they've got this fantastic programme, um, lots of information on their website about that. So the sort of bronze level, silver level and gold level and organizations no matter what size they can they can look at that and see what they would like to aim for the arts council have grant funding available as well to help grassroots venues and festivals um, um, you know achieve achieve these levels of accessibility so really there's you know there's no financial barriers um, that should be in place for for uh, festivals and events to to work with attitude and get yeah get their get their get their, their gradings, their charter grading. So yeah, look, look, look on their website and have a look. Fantastic. Um, there's also a lot of other accessibility issues that uh, we encounter that we don't always think about. So um, Hannah, I want to ask how you think digital media is changing the landscape for young people to enter the industry and find opportunities and network and job search. Um, how do we deal with different socioeconomic factors such as div digital poverty or place privilege. So being from the Northeast, there is probably a sense of being quite disconnected from uh, the major industry in London. What are your thoughts? Yeah, we um, we struggle with this in the Northeast quite a lot. Um, we have been traditionally isolated from the rest of the music industry, and that's why Generate is so important um, in the region, because we have developed and kind of bring that knowledge that is based elsewhere into the region for our artists and, and for the industry here. Um, also, we uh, one of the kind of uh, level of, there's a quite a high level of deprivation within our region as well. Um, and that obviously translates into digital poverty. So even though throughout the course of particularly the last six, seven months over the over the course of the pandemic, we've managed to put everything that we would usually do online. Um, and in some ways that has been great and that has opened it up to other audiences. People have been able to access it who might not have been able to otherwise. But also we are acutely aware that it also kind of excludes a whole bunch of people and potential artists there and talent that just can't get there. And so we need to do a lot more work with working with our local authorities and working with other services to understand the importance of music and the importance of digital and music together and how how we can help influence those policies at that kind of level to make sure that um, the people who we need to get to and who we want to work with are able to also get to us. Um, because there's only so much we can do as a very small organisation, um, you know, stopping short of getting money to give everyone an iPad. It, you know, we it's quite difficult to do it unless there's some wider, wider help. Um, I think that we generate is quite an interesting organization because we have a digital arm to what we do um, which is separate in some ways to music but works across the creative industries and um, we've seen that kind of digital adoption has increased um, four times as fast as it was predicted to have done in the last six months um, so we are well ahead of where we should have where we thought we were going to be um, which is one in one way is great, but in another way is leaving people behind and is making it quite difficult to um, to kind of access the right information for the right people at the right time. So what we need to do is to look at what are the key things that artists and people in the music industry in our region need help with what, and what's the best way of doing that. Um, and and how do we make sure that they, they get access to that information 
um, in the right way. And if that means that we can't do everything online, then we have to find another way because otherwise we're going to lose out on, on getting to that talent and we're going to lose out on all that richness of what our region has. And we're quite a resilient bunch and, you know, we don't mind kind of digging our heels in and we don't mind plowing on and getting things done. But I'm really concerned about the number of people who are falling through the gaps and those gaps seem to be getting bigger in, in places that we um, didn't expect them to right now. So we need to we need to look at those and think about how we can kind of provide those safety nets and make sure that we're still collecting people and we're still kind of we're here to support you. Um, but how do you how do you need that support? Is it easier for us to have uh, give you an artist advice session about completing a funding application over the phone rather than a Zoom call or a Teams call because you can't get ten minutes alone in your house with your seven brothers and sisters and whoever else to have that chat so that you know we've got to work at working around that and part of that's down to us as an organization being able to adapt going forward um so i think it's a fine line that we're walking at the minute um and and i think it's quite easy to tip either way um on a, almost on a daily basis sometimes um but we'll we'll continue to try and do our best that's really interesting. I have no experience myself um, of the industry in the north, and I think it's something that we should all think a little bit more about. Um, Naz, I earlier. Uh, so, look, the poverty and accessibility, I think it's absolutely crucial, especially in the time that we're in at the moment. Um, and actually, if you connect all the dots, there are a lot of links between other factors and digital poverty as well. So, for example, you know, we mentioned earlier a lot of women and people of um, ethnic background are creating their own business because they feel like they don't set up. But if they don't have, you know, the digital infrastructure to do those things, then, you know, it negates their ability to do that. They don't have the capacity or the resources. Um, also, you know, when it comes to women and working practices, you know, being able as a recruiter, being able to be more flexible with, kid, uh, you know, women with families and, you know, working from home and stuff, you know, you need to improve the infrastructure. So I, I guess there is a responsibility there um, from the music industry as a whole, but there are also responsibility from the policy makers uh, and local authority to support those people with digital poverty. Uh, and also, you know, those the, the providers, whether it's the internet providers, you know, to make sure that access to internet and bandwidth is sufficient enough for people to be able to do what they need to do from home. Um, and it's important to sort of uh, use trade bodies and uh, influence policymakers to kind of uh, change policies and approach it holistically as a nation, as opposed to an industry approach, because digital poverty doesn't just, um, you know, impact music business, it impacts schooling, it impacts um, other um, industries as well. So it's absolutely crucial for us to, particularly at this time where everyone's on lockdown working from home, to be man mindful of digital poverty and see ways in which we can improve that and allow everyone access to the online platforms and, you know, internet. Yeah, you mentioned um, ethnic minorities there and we only have five minutes left, but I would really like to finish off by touching on racism in the industry. Um, there have been huge discussions around race this year in the interest of more black people dying because of COVID, the US uprising after the untimely death of George Floyd, which led to businesses begin to show gestures that attempted to shine a light on how they would attempt to change their internal company culture. This is by recognising institutional, structural and interpersonal change. With Spotify in the US curating Bain Friday, which tried to champion uh, black and ethnic ethnic minority music to show solidarity. Sony also reacted with the announcement of a $100 million social fund. Do we think these gestures are helping? The UK music's 10 point plan provokes the need for action. For example, Urban was to be eradicated by all labels by the end of October. I want to get all of your thoughts on this, please. My, my fault or? Yep. 
Yeah, I mean, look, um, you know, we're, we're living in strange times uh, and globally there's so many things going on in terms of, you know, what's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement, what's happening in Nigeria with all the um, killings by the government, uh, you know, American election with Donald Trump and here in the UK we have our political issues as well. So I think um, th there's a sense that, you know, um, there are answers out there uh, as as individuals we may not probably be able to have the capacity or the resources to do things to affect changes but collectively if we work together um, uh, and join up and share resources i think we can make um, positive changes and uh, you know there have been pro what, what's important is that to understand where we are now we need to acknowledge the progress that's been made. And I think there are huge progresses that have been made. Uh, and there are people out there who are passionate about, you know, making those changes. But we need to then take stock of where we are and then um, identify areas which needs to improve. And clearly there is, and there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And then we just have to work in a cohesive manner to ensure that those changes are done and, and they're made and they're accelerated uh, and they're implemented in the uh, in the workplace, in the industry and the wider society as well. I think it's a societal thing. So um, individually, perhaps we might not be able to do things and they're little things, but collectively, if we're all working towards the same goals, I think it's more powerful and we can all kind of, you know, work together. So, you know, if you have women in control and if you have um, people addressing racial diversity, people um, uh, addressing gender diversity, disability, you know, you sit, share your resources, you work together, you, you know, uplift each other, you highlight each other's goals and, and, and you sort of go out there and holistically approach this. Um, there's no one answer fits all kind of, um, you know, approach it has to be a holistic thing and there are all these elements that needs to come together for us to make these changes and difference and i think um over the years it has been done and we have made great progresses and we should acknowledge that but there is so much more to do and we need to continue working hard what's important is that we don't make uh, those achievements and we don't get to a point where um year on year we then take one step forward and two step back we continue taking a step forward and you know, we don't um, rest on our laurels and we don't take anything for granted. And we're sort of determined in our conviction to make changes. Yeah, I, um, as an example, we, we did speak about recently um, the Brits So White hashtag that circulated in response to the Brits having no nominees from ethnic minority backgrounds. This was a few years ago now. Um, but it's really interesting what the BPI has done to review its internal company culture. And I was wondering if you could just touch on that briefly. Yeah, I mean, uh, I joined the year after this whole Brit So Why It Happened. So, um, you know, I, I was very close to the whole backlash of it. And off the back of that, you know, we, you know, we looked at ourselves, we self-evaluated and we said to ourselves, why did this happen and how did this happen? So, you know, just for context, you know, the Brit Awards is it, made up of uh, uh, an academy of people from the recording industry, whether it's executives, um, uh, Brit school students or even um, journalists and stuff. So we, you know, um, we looked at the makeup of the Brits Academy and we said, okay, let's look at, um, you know, addressing the gender balance within that. Let's look at address the uh, racial balance within that. And I think, all, you know, over the course of the years, we've achieved a gender and racial balance. And that culminated in the 2020 Brit Awards, where you had, you know, Stormzy perform, where you had Dave perform, uh, May, um, Lil Mix, uh, Billie Eilish, Lizzo, and even Celeste won in the, you know, um, Brits Rising Star Award. So um, all that work that we've done in the lead up to the 2020 had culminated in positive changes. And we continuously each year look at ourselves, self-evaluate and can improve the processes and it's important to be self-critical, it's important to highlight your own weaknesses and um, where possible make those improvement and you know we, I know from personal experience I work with some incredible people internally at the BPI and the Brick Awards who are hugely passionate about affecting changes and they're incredibly supportive and you know they all buy into this so um, um, you know I'm part of this um, 
Equality and Justice uh, Board now, but actually that board is an evolution from the Brit Advisory Board who did a lot of work with the Brit Awards to kind of affect those changes within the um, academy. So those individuals who made those changes and had a part, of, part to play in influence those changes it evolved into now what we are, which is the Brits uh, uh, Equality and Justice Advisory Board. And it's the same people, uh, they're all renowned within the um, you know, music industry and the wider industry, and they're all passionate about you know, advising the Brit Awards and the BPI in terms of our approach, which we then uh, can take to the record labels, uh, whether it's the majors or independents, uh, to kind of um, encourage and voice and effect changes and get them to buy into what we're trying to do. Yeah, and I think the work that um, the BPI are doing is really inspiring to the whole industry. And I think the biggest conclusion that we can draw from this conversation is how we must really start holding ourselves accountable, challenging companies and processes and measuring our success by data, as proven by the report that came out this week. And before preaching what other people are doing, we must really hold ourselves accountable and make sure that our own practices are as diverse as they can be and reflective of what we're pledging, essentially. Um, and also developing a collaborative environment where egos and credit are set aside just for one moment so we can work together and facilitate change through joint resources is probably going to be the fastest way we're going to see momentum build and make change. Thank you so much to all of you for being part of our panel today. Um, is there any final messages you would like to say? Um, for, for me, absolutely. I think it's important, as you said, you know, collaborative uh, and working in a collaborative in environment is absolutely um, essential. And, you know, to pick up on something you mentioned earlier about potentially shaming companies into, uh, you know, doing things um, I think you mentioned Live Nation earlier um, and I, I, I don't think that's a that's a you know that's an approach because what then happens is that you know these companies become defensive and then they close up and they don't want to engage with you anymore because they you know they feel like it's a hostile environment whereas if you're approaching it differently um, looking to work collaboratively you know you kind of engage with them get their buy-in and you know, um, influence the changes that you feel that needs to be made. So uh, it's you know, it's it's absolutely essential that everyone works together, uh, pooling their resources and pulling in the right direction, um, uh, and identifying you know your own weaknesses and the weaknesses as a collective, and where we can improve. Um, and and those people involved in those kind of boards need to reflect that this as well. So you know. Um, when it comes to diversity, including neurodiversity and physical diversity, when it comes to gender equality, you know, having non-binary people on board as well and sexuality and all, you know, there's a whole sphere of, um, you know, inclusivity that you should be tapping into in order to address all of those issues. Absolutely. I think that's a really great place to leave it. So thank you so much to everyone for joining the panel and uh, all the guests. I hope you enjoyed.